Good morning to everybody. It is good to see everybody here this morning. Yeah, they don't want to see me. Uh, we do appreciate everyone being here, whether you're visiting with us online or visiting with us here. In the gospel meeting that we had this last week, Brother Jesse Stevens made a lot of good points about the eldership. Thelma talked to me this morning. Thelma Hughes said the congregation she went and visited Sunday morning, they were singing during the Lord's Supper and things like that, and elders will give account for that. The elders that are allowing that will give an account. Elders must be godly men who are willing to sacrifice themselves for the flock. It was taught in the gospel meeting, however, that if an elder's child leaves home and becomes unfaithful, that in no way affects the status of his qualifications of being an elder that are set forth in the Scriptures. And there are a lot of congregations in this area that teach that. But I want to ask the question, what does the Bible have to say? What does the Scripture say? We're going to do some digging today. You're going to learn some Greek today. Don't let that frighten you. It's no harder than learning English. It's probably easier to learn than English. But what we want to do first of all is look at the verses that talk about the children in the qualifications of an elder. That's found in two passages. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and Titus chapter 1, verse 6. So let's start with 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5. We're going to read both verses. It says of an elder, He is one that ruleth as well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? That's just logical. That just makes sense. I want to read to you the same verses from the literal translation of the Bible. It says, ruling his own house well, having children in subjection with all respect. But if anyone does not know how to rule his own house, how will he care for an assembly of God? <clears throat> what we want to do in 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, I want to look at the words there that you see highlighted in red. It is the word ruleth, having, subjection, and gravity. And I got these from uh, Greek English lexicon back there, or Greek English New Testament. I also use Moulton's lexicon and the analytical, the new analytical lexicon and vines and other sources. When you look at the word ruleth, it is the Greek word prostomenon. Now, whenever you look in the lexicon, it will tell you it is the accusative singular masculine participle present middle of prostema. Don't let that scare you. It's pretty simple. It's the accusative. That's the accusative case. And these come from Summer's Greek uh, book on Greek and also Brother Guy in Woods' book on Greek. That just means the action is extend or extends to and is limited to the object. In other words, he is ruling his children. That's what that's talking about. He is ruling his children. That's the accusative case. It is in the singular masculine, which just means he. He is the one that is doing this. It is a participle. Uh, the Greek has things that the English does not, and this is one of them. A participle in the Greek is a verbal adjective. It has the characteristic of a verb and an adjective. So in other words, it shows action and it also describes those two things put together. So in other words, he is ruling his house well. It describes him and it shows action. It is in the present tense. And this is Brother Guy in Woods' definition of the present tense. A continuous act in progress at the present time. So in other words, and I'll put this up there in a little while, if you take an arrow, and I'll try to do this where it makes sense to your direction, you take an arrow and you start here and you extend it. And the point of that arrow is at the end. 
That is present tense. It is a continuous action again that is in progress now. It's going on now. It started sometime in the past and it is going on now. It is in the middle voice. That means the subject is some way acting upon itself. In other words, he is ruling well. He is the one who is performing the action and the action is also going upon his family. Now it's all those things, and this is the Greek word prostamia, from which it is derived. That word, and this is Moulton's lexicon, means to preside, govern, or superintend. So uh, we'll put all this together here in a little bit. Now we want to look at the word having. Having is children in subjection. The word having there is akanta, the Greek word. It is the accusative, singular, masculine, present, active, participle of echo. And whenever I was looking it up, one of the lexicons gave Mark 9.17 as an example. So let's look at that verse. One of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought, that word have there is the same thing, same word, unto thee my son which hath a dumb spirit. In other words, he is there now. He has gotten there now. The accusative case. Again, the subject or action extends to and is limited to the object. Same thing as a while ago. The singular masculine is he. It's in the present tense again, having a continuous act in progress at the present time. In other words, or excuse me, the active voice, that means the subject is acting. He is having or he is in possession of. It is a participle, again a verbal adjective, as we explained a while ago. And then echo means to have or possess. That is Moulton's lexicon. So in other words, he at the present time is possessing his house or ruling his house in a good manner. Well, now it says his children are to be in subjection. That is a patage. It is the third person singular aorist subjective passes of of apatasso. Apatasso. Third person means he, she, it. Same as in English. He, she, it. It is in the aorist tense. That means an action that took place in the past without regard to its duration. Whenever you look in the Greek things back there, and I'm no Greek scholar, don't even want to pretend to be, but I've got all these books back there I have to go through to try to find this. They define the aorist tense as a point, a period. Where the present tense is an arrow, the aorist tense is a point. In other words, it is in, they're in subjection now. They're in subjection now. It is in the subjunctive mood. Brother Wood said that means it is conditional. Summers in his book said it is possible but not reality. And they give kind of an example. That the example he gives is if the child runs, he will escape. So in other words, it's not something that's happened yet, but if this happens, then this will happen. So here, if he has his children in subjection, then he qualifies to be an elder. So that was kind of an if-then statement. It's in the passive voice. That means it was completed in the past. In other words, they were in subjection and they are in subjection. That hasn't changed. And then upatasso there just means submissiveness. They are submissive to their parent there. And then it says, in all gravity... That Greek word there is semnotetos. It is the genitive singular of semnotes. And then you have to step one further back. It is derived from sebamai. It is in the genitive case. That means it describes. It qualifies the word or idea that it modifies. In other words, his children to be in all gravity. It is describing them. It's describing them. Again, it is singular. He, she, it. 
And then sebamai means gravity, dignity, and I like this one, dignified seriousness. And that's from Moulton's lexicon. They are dignified and serious. Or in other words, we put all that together and elder rules and continues to rule his own house well. Having to possess and continuing to possess children that were and are submissive and that are dignified and serious. That's what we get when we put all of that together from 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5. Now let's look at 1 Timothy 1, 6. First of all, the King James Version. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. I want to look at the literal translation and Young's literal translation of that verse. The literal translation says, If anyone is blameless, husband of one wife, having faithful children, not in accusation of loose behavior or disobedience, or disobedient. The Young's literal translation says, If anyone is blameless of one wife a husband, having children steadfast, not under accusation of riotous living or insubordinate. Now you'll notice from these two, compared to what the King James said a while ago, it says not accused. Whenever you look at that, they're not accused. Really and truly, whenever you oops, going the wrong way. Whenever you look at the verses, it, that word's a noun, and that's what it'll say in the definition. It's an accusation, not just accused. But in Titus one six, we want to examine the following words: having, faithful, accused, riot, and unruly. So let's start by looking at the word having. It is from the Greek word ekon, which is a nominative, singular, masculine, participle, present of echo. Again, it is in the nominative case. This is a different word from what we saw a while ago, and that's why I wanted, that's why you have all that printed out, so you can look at that. It's a different Greek word. This, in the nominative case, it's the case of designation. Its main use is that of the subject of the sentence. In other words, that's the elder in this case. The elder is having something. So that's what we're looking at in the nominative case. It is in the singular masculine, which means he. Again, that's referring to the elder, the male. It is a participle, a verbal adjective. So it not only is showing possession as a, as a verb, but it's also describing Him. It shows an action and it describes Him. It is in the present tense. Again, remember, a continuous act in progress at the present time. In other words, whenever now is, it is still in action. It is still in progress. The word echo again means to have or possess. So again, it's derived from the same word that we saw a while ago in 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, but it is a little bit different being it is the nominative case. An example of this word is found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Now what I want to do, and I don't mean the word, I mean present tense. I want to look at a verse here that shows us what the present tense means. Jesus said, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The Greek word translated ask, seek, and knock are all in the present tense. So in other words, as long as you have present time, you're to continue asking, continue seeking, and continue knocking. It doesn't stop. It is something we are continually doing. 
It started in the past and it's extending to now. Whenever now is. You know, if I'm alive tomorrow, I will have a now tomorrow. So it will continue to be that way. Again, a continuous act in progress at the present time. You have been asking. You are asking. That would be a good way to look at that. And again, that shows us what the present tense would look like. It starts and it keeps going. It doesn't stop. Okay? Now we want to look at the word faithful. Having faithful children. The Greek word there is pesta. It is the accusative plural neuter of pistos. The accusative case, the action it stands to and is limited to the object. In other words, the children. What we're looking at there is the children. The children are to be faithful. The plural neuter means they. They are to be faithful. The Greek word pistos means faithful, true, or trusty. That's from the New Analytical Greek Lexicon. Vines has this to say of the Greek word pistos. He says, and he has you know different things, A, B, C, through there. I just want to look at A. A in the active sense, and the present tense is the active sense there. So in the active sense means believing, trusting. In other words, it has not stopped. They are still believing. They are still trusting. He said it is best understood with significance in A above. So we're looking at the same thing. For example, in Galatians 3.9, Acts 16.1, 2 Corinthians 6.15, and Titus 1.6. So let's take a look now and see these verses that he's talking about. How are these verses or what do they look like? Galatians 3.9, it is the word faith that is translated from pistos. It says, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. All right, whenever you look at that word there, when is that faith? Was it in the past? Or is it now? It's both, isn't it? We have faith in the past. We have faith now. Because that's the faith of Abraham. He had the faith to leave Ur of Chaldees and he had the faith to move down into the land of Canaan. He had faith that God would do something to raise Isaac from the dead or something if he sacrificed him and he followed through. Abraham has faith would be the way we could look at that. Now let's look at Acts 16.1. And the word believed down there is the one that's translated from Pistos. It says, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. So when did his mother believe? And I know I said that in the past tense, but that's what the word is. It was now. She believed in the past and she believes now. All right, now look at 2 Corinthians 6.15 and the word believeth is translated from pistols. It says, In what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with that infidel? When is that person called a believer? Now. They believe now. They haven't left, but they are now a believer. So what part does a person that is believing now have with an infidel or one that does not believe? And then Titus 1.6, the verse that we're looking at. If any be blameless, the husband of wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. When are the children faithful? They're faithful now. You take that along with the present tense of having. It is a continual act in progression at the present time. Whenever the present time is. Now, we're going to look at the word accused. I found that kind of interesting. I don't know if we get our word category from this, but it's from kategoria is the Greek word there. And this is something else I found interesting. It's the dative singular feminine noun of categoria. <laughs> well, both words are in there. 
Dative case means the case of reception. In other words, these people are not receiving an accusation. That's the children. They are not receiving an accusation. You'll notice it is a noun. So it's an accusation. Categoria means an accusation or crimination. That is Moulton. So his children cannot be accused of riot, which is the next one we're going to look at. Asotius, or excuse me, Asotius, the genitive singular of Asotia. The genitive case is description. It qualifies the word or idea it modifies. So in other words, it's describing the children not accused of riot, not in the accusation. Singular, he, she, it. Asatia means the disposition and life of one who is abandoned, recklessly debauched. So it is a lifestyle that this child is practicing. And they're also not accused of being unruly. Anup pataka or patakta. Accusative plural neuter of anup pataktas. Accusative, the action extends to and is limited to the object, that's the children. They are the object of the sentence. The word is in the neuter, that means they. And then anuppatoktos means insubordinate, refractory. And I looked up the word refractory, it means stubborn. Disorderly, contumacious. I had to look that word up too. It means willfully disobedient to authority or lawless. Alright, so whenever we put all this together in Titus 1.6, an elder has children that are continually faithful as long as he's an elder. A continuous action up to the present time. Whenever he is an elder, his children are faithful at the present time. There are never any accusations that can be truthfully made that they are recklessly debauched or stubborn or willfully disobedient to authority. They cannot be truthfully accused. They may be accused. But it cannot be truthfully accused. So, if an elder's children are not continually faithful, he no longer meets that qualification. The present tense in the Greek shows that. So when an elder's children leave home, do they cease to be his children? You know, Daniel's left home. Is he no longer my son? No, he still is. The question you want to ask is, how do we know if our children are still faithful until after they leave home? I read an article here a while back that many of the people in that, many of the children in that article that were teenagers said, we quit believing that a long time ago. We just went with mom and dad so they wouldn't bother us. When they left home, that's when their unfaithfulness came into being, when it was shown. So that just asks us the question, how many of our children leave God while they're still at home and never show any signs of it till they leave home? How do we know that if our children... How can we even say they're faithful while they're at home? Because all they're doing is going with mom and dad. But if it was the case that it didn't matter if a, child, if a man's children were unfaithful after they left home, I want to ask you, let's say we have a man, and I'm going to give credit where credit is due. I believe Darren told me this. If we have a man who is in his 70s, we'll say, maybe 60s, and he's converted to Christ. And you go back and look, where, you know, Paul did a lot of teaching in heathen cities, did he not? If a man is converted into Christ, whenever he's 70, we'll say, and then he converts all of his children. And they are now all faithful to God. Would that man qualify as an elder? If his children had to be faithful at home, he could not because they weren't faithful at home. That man would be told that he could not be an elder. 
But if His children are faithful at the present time. Well, I want to look at one other thing. There's an argument that I heard about Abraham that he could not be an elder in the church if his children were unfaithful. And Ishmael was the one brought up, I believe, as being unfaithful. It goes to this verse, Genesis 18, 18 and 19. This is before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah whenever He came to him, Abraham there. It says, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So God knew that Abraham would bring up his children in the right way. That he would teach them to do right. And since Ishmael did not do right, then Abraham couldn't even have been an elder in the Lord's church even though he brought him up right. Alright? Well, number one, Abraham lived under a different covenant. You know, we've got to remember that. There are different covenants. Number two, the Bible never says Ishmael was unfaithful to God. Now, the verse that could be brought up is Genesis 21.9. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. All right, that, that's wrong. He was mocking. But then Ishmael was only 14 or 15 years old whenever he did that. And was not Isaac and Rebekah, weren't they already married whenever they lied to King Abimelech about her being his sister instead of his wife? So it doesn't mean an elder's children are not going to sin. It just means they're not accused of right and unruly. But he was only 14 or 15 years old. Let's go back and look and prove that. Genesis 12, 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. So there we have Abram, or Abraham, being 75 when they left Haran to go down into the land of Canaan. In Genesis 16.3, said Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Now Abraham is 85. He's been in the land ten years. In Genesis 21.5, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So if Ishmael was conceived when Abraham was 85. He could have been 85 or 86 whenever Ishmael was born. Isaac was born 14 years later. So Ishmael at that time, Genesis 21, 6 that we read a while ago, or in 21, he was been only 14 or 15 years old. But you know, Abraham doesn't have anything to do with the qualifications of an elder anyway. So when you study the qualification of believing children, and I hope I didn't lose anybody because I almost got lost a few times in doing this, the Bible is very clear. An elder's children must be faithful while they're at home, be in subjection. The word faithful there means believing as well. And when are we called believers? When we're Christians. So they have to be Christians faithful at home. They must continue to be faithful after they leave home for Him to meet that one qualification. Having believing children. It is a continuous action up to the present time. Whenever the present time is. Well, if I confused anybody, you can ask Leland and he'll straighten you out on it. But I hope I didn't confuse anybody. But this morning, the Bible is also not confusing on what we have to do to become a child of God. It's very clear that we must hear the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We must believe the words that are written in the Bible, Hebrews 11, 6. Believe that God is and He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We must repent of sin. Be sorry for what we did. Make the commitment that we're not going to do it again. Change our lifestyle. Luke 13, 3 and 5. We must confess the deity of Christ. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. If we deny Christ, He'll deny us. 
We must be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, 22.16. But then we also must live faithful unto death. There's that present tense, is it not? Keep living faithfully at the present time. When we die, we don't have another present time. But we have to be faithful up to that point. So if you have a need this morning to put your Lord on in baptism, to repent and come back to Him, or if you need the prayers of the church for any reason, we invite you to come now and make your need known as we stand and sing.